So what did ARM provide us with seven years ago inside the Cortex M core? So we were given a 32-bit RISC architecture. So that was uh, the first design feature they provided for us. The big benefit over the older ARM7, ARM9 cores was that you could do everything in the C language. So that was the big step from ARM7 and ARM9, where you had to have startup files in assembly. Every time you wanted to switch mode, you had to drop back into assembly to do that. And every time you entered an interrupt routine, you had to go via assembly code. That was all removed with the uh, Cortex-M cores. Very low interrupt latency was added. So historically, I think on the ARM7, you had two interrupts, if I remember correctly. And it was somewhere from about 15 cycles to 30 odd cycles. It wasn't very deterministic how long it took to enter the interrupt modes. So with the Cortex M cores now, you've now got 12 cycles to enter the interrupt service routine. So guaranteed all the time, you will have 12 cycles. Smaller code footprint, so they rearranged all the instruction sets uh, from the old ARM7 and ARM9. So you've got the new FUM2 instruction set, so that was all provided. And ARM's main focus area for their products was mobile phone technology. So low power modes were fairly well embedded inside the core. There was lots of different uh, features you could enable to put the device into low power modes inside there. Then they provided some optional features like single cycle multiply and the 24-bit cystic timer. So they were just optional features that not every vendor chose to use. Within the SDM32, we took all those optional features. So every optional feature that was available from ARM, we included in the SDM32. So what ARM gave, we said, right, come on, we'll take all of these features and we'll put it into a new product. So the instruction set that we've got for the Cortex-M cores, uh, you heard John Mark talking about the M0 and M0 Plus. So that's the smallest instruction set built of mostly the 16-bit instructions of the FOM2 architecture. Then as you move out into the Cortex-M3, you gain a lot more instructions uh, in the 32-bit uh, arena. Then as we come out even further, we gain all these new DSP instructions that were part of the difference between Cortex M3 and Cortex M4. So all of these were added into the device. And then again, there was the optional floating point features uh, with the dedicated instructions there for doing the floating point mathematical calculations. The key benefit is here, the Cortex M4 shares exactly the same instruction set as the M7. So no instructions have to change. If you had a binary file currently built for the M4, it will run inside the M7, provided the peripherals are matching. So that any core routines or plain mathematical routines, the same binary file you had will work in there. <clears throat> there will be differences. You'll see what we've changed in the core, or what ARM have changed in the core that can make it run a lot faster. So it does encourage you to recompile. I wouldn't take it straight from an F4 binary and load in. I would recompile because the new features you will see are going to make a big difference to your performance of your application. So what do we actually have in the Cortex M4? So the Cortex-M4 is version 7E-M of ARM's architecture, not to be confused with ARM7. Um, was when we first launched it, people were saying ARM7. No, that's ARM's version number, which is completely different. We had a Harvard architecture with a three-stage pipeline inside the device. You had your 12 cycles to divide and the SIMD instructions, which come from the DSP instruction set. And we have the memory protection unit as well. There's that optional item again, the floating point unit. And as I said, we took all the optional extras that ARM provided and put them inside our device. So if we look at the block diagram of the core itself, you've got the 
interrupt and wake up controllers inside there. You've got all the bus matrix and connectivity to the rest of the device inside the core. And you have all your debug and trace elements that are all inside the core. So these are all common features of the Cortex M core. So if we now compare that to the Cortex M7, so I'll start with the block diagram again. So you've still got your wake up controller and your interrupt controller. There's the core itself, which is still ARM 7E-M. It's exactly the same core. So nothing has actually changed inside the core. There's the optional floating point unit. There's all your debug and trace still available. There's all the bus matrix sections that were there. What has changed are these new blocks here, which are the memory management units. So there's extra memory modules inside the core itself. So these aren't ST blocks, these are ARM IP blocks that we've got in there. <clears throat> so to help the uh, core along to get the higher speeds, we're now up to a six stage pipeline. So that will be explained a bit more in detail why we've gone to a six stage pipeline. We now have what's called dual issue superscalar architecture inside the core. So again, we'll see what that means in the coming few slides. Still have your division in 12 cycles and your SIMD instruction. It's the same core, it's the same instruction set. So it should be, still be there. Memory protection is still there, and the floating point unit is still an option, and it's still there. And just as the M4, we have also taken the floating point in the Cortex M7 as well. So there's four new things to pay attention to inside this core. Two of these new things will take us closer to a true DSP, and the other two items will take us closer to a real-time processor. So we're going to have a look now at these four new items that ARM have provided for us to bring the performance of the device up compared to the Cortex-M4.